Welcome to Letting Grow, the podcast about one of the spiritual journey's most difficult and courageous moments, letting go of who we think we should be so we can grow into who we most deeply are. I'm your host, Claire Villarreal, and I appreciate your joining me today. Let's talk about the bardo of this life. Now, traditionally, this is actually the first bardo state that's described in Tibetan teachings on the death and rebirth process. And I've kind of saved it for last because, well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not the sexiest of the bardo states. Like often people kind of skip over the bardo of this life because they want to get into like the juicy stuff about death and the intermediate state and rebirth or at least to nerds like me, that's the juicy, exciting stuff. And, you know, we all think we know about the life, the bardo of this life. But this is actually, in a way, the bardo state where we have the most control over whether we're going to practice the dharma, or whether we're going to try and recognize our own nature or not. So the bardo of this life is described as beginning when we're born or beginning when we're conceived. You kind of hear it both ways. And going until we begin the actively dying process, when we begin the bardo of death. So that means this bardo state is by far the longest of any of the states that we're talking about. And it has within it different bardo states, like sub bardo. So like the bardo of dream, the bardo of meditation. So the bardo of dream happens, obviously, when our ordinary mind is kind of out for the night and we create this whole dream world and we live some experience it seems so real to us and then that whole thing dissolves and again that kind of underscores the nature of a bardo state that it is a time in between it there's a beginning to it there's an end to it and really you could say every single day is like a bardo you know we wake up in the morning And that day lasts from the morning until the time that we go to bed. And then in the evening, it's the bardo of sleep and the bardo of dream for us. The same thing when we sit down to meditate. From the time that we really settle into our own mind, we're in the bardo of meditation. We've left behind ordinary mind and we're experiencing something a little bit different. But we're all familiar with sort of ordinary waking life. So why would this be, in a way, the most potent time for practicing and having that that practice pay off? As we know, in the Tibetan teachings on the death and rebirth process, as we die, our ordinary mind kind of is stripped away until we just get down to the basic layer of our mind, which is described in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition as Buddha nature. And and at that point, our true nature just naturally arises in our experience. We don't have to do anything to experience it. So why isn't that the most optimal time to like wake up out of our dreams of, of ego fixation? I mean, in a way it is, obviously. Like we're all gonna experience our Buddha nature firsthand. So if we can recognize that and rest in it, then boom, we're done. We're out of this whole death and rebirth cycle that Buddhism talks about. But here's the kicker. Most of us have not spent time familiarizing ourselves with our true nature, learning to recognize that, learning to rest in it. So for most of us, it actually is not necessarily going to be super helpful that we go through the bardo of clear light at the end of the death process and we are fully present to our own nature because we don't know what it is. And in, if we don't know what it is, we kind of black out and then we wake up again and we don't even remember that we went through that. So this is where the bardo of this life is super important in Tibetan teachings on the death and rebirth process because in the bardo of this life, the way we live is the way we're going to die. Like, It's pretty clear in really any teachings on the contemplative life that you can't live your life one way and then sit down and meditate or do some qigong or whatever it is and suddenly your mind is going to like become clear and pure when before all you were thinking about was, I don't know how to make an extra 30 or 40 bucks in the day and just chasing after these like little things that seem so important but aren't at the end of the day. 
So really, this is the main idea of this podcast episode of the teachings on the bardo of this life, is that we, we have this precious opportunity to spend our time creating the habits we want instead of spending our time falling into the habits that already own us. Like the whole Buddhist path of awakening basically could be understood as one long series of decisions of like trying to wake up from our deluded state, trying to wake up from this idea that like, I'm permanent, everyone around me is permanent, the way things are right now is the way they're always going to be. Has that ever worked for anyone? <laughs> it's, it's ultimately going to be disproven every single time if we, if we think that things are just going to stay the same. And that's the game that we're sold. You know, if you're looking at a magazine, you see these thin, beautiful people and they have like expensive clothing and it just looks like they have their stuff together. And it sets a high bar for us to try and have our stuff together. And for me, one of the real insights of Buddhism is that we're never going to get there. If we have, you know, five minutes where it feels like we've just, we've got all the ducks lined up, probably in the next five minutes, something else is going to happen and we're going to be trying to get all our ducks in a row again. So when we can live life with more of a recognition of impermanence, more of a recognition that we're not going to get everything perfect because you can't get everything perfect. Real life doesn't work that way. So the more we can actually live into that when it comes time to die, when it comes time to go through a big transition in life even, we're not just blindsided because we felt like other people can age, but I won't age. Other people can get sick. I won't get sick. Other people can die, but the people I love won't die. I won't die. So these practices I'm going to talk about today for the bardo of this life, you could think of them as training to die or to go through big transitions, but you could also just think of them as training to live well, to really recognize life as it is instead of as we think it's going to be one day, and to live what's real instead of waiting to finally have it all together, to finally look on the inside to ourselves the way that other people look to us on Instagram or any of these platforms where people get to curate what we're seeing about them. Okay, so enough soapbox. The main point is how we live is how we die and how we train in our contemplative lives helps us live better because it helps us live more real realistically. So how do we do that? I've been rereading Mind Beyond Death by Dzogchen Punlap Rinpoche recently. It's such a good book. I've read it, I don't know how many times now, several times at least. I always learn something new from it. And this time, one thing that's really striking me is that he often talks about practices we can do from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition to help us go through this process of death and rebirth better. And for those of us who are kind of steeped in Tibetan Buddhism, we know that practices specifically for the death process are actually pretty advanced. Like some of the most advanced teachings are about the nature of mind and how to recognize it as you go through the death process. So it's easy to think like, well, I'm just kind of, you know, a beginner or an ordinary meditator or whatever, like all this stuff doesn't really apply to me. But... What Dzogchen Pullen Rinpoche is saying is even the most basic stuff, even learning how to rest your mind on an object, even learning to interrogate your own thoughts, so that be calm abiding type meditations and special insight type meditations, even those can be really helpful at the time of death. And incidentally, they're really helpful in your lifetime as well. And for both the death process and for the life process, um, they're helpful partly because they, they allow us to stabilize the mind. So with the calm abiding exercises, we're learning how to keep the mind on an object that we choose. We're learning to really lean into active attention versus passive attention. And any kind of mindfulness practice that you do will include an element of this calm abiding meditation. Every time you return your attention to the breath when it's wandered off, you're doing calm abiding meditation. You're learning how to focus on an object. And the reason I say 
it's about active attention is that you're choosing an object to focus on rather than whatever is shiniest and newest in your world is the thing that grabs your attention and pulls you all over the place. So that's calm abiding meditation. It's a whole huge category of meditations. And if you're interested, there's strong elements of that in the meditations that I post here. I also have a podcast called Meditate with Claire that has a bunch of guided meditations and they have a strong element of that as well. If you're interested in learning more about this, I have a free course called Essential Tools of Meditation for Meditation. Anyway, Essential Tools is in the title. I'll include a link in the show notes where you can find it. And it includes specifically meditations for cultivating calm abiding and for cultivating special insight and also for cultivating a warm heart towards ourselves, which helps with all the categories of meditation. So that's calm abiding with a special insight meditation. Really what that's about is learning to see into who we really are. And obviously the Buddhist tradition offers some really profound approaches to that. They can be very specialized approaches, but even something as simple as learning to recognize thoughts and how to separate thoughts from reality or how to separate them from our physical and, you know, all of our sensory perceptions, that's really helpful as well. And it helps us to start discriminating what's truly us versus what we're putting on from the outside. And for our purposes here in this podcast, in the context of the the teachings on the death and rebirth cycle, the ultimate goal, you could say, of the special insight meditations is is to, to see with our mind that all of our ordinary sense of self is not who we are at the deepest level and to cut through and cut through and cut through all those layers until finally our, we open up to something that is beyond mind. It's beyond our conventional sense of self, something that Buddhists would call Buddha nature. I think probably a lot of Christians would call it Christ consciousness. There's other ways of describing it, but that's sort of the end goal of this idea of special insight, of cutting through everything that is not real. So both of these, you can find a lot of different types of meditation on these topics, including some of the meditations that you'll find in this podcast feed. So if you feel like a beginner, you want some stuff to do that's very accessible, that's what all of these meditations I'm offering here are for. But you may also know that there's a whole category of more imaginative meditations that a serious practitioner might do in order to prepare for the time of death. And a lot of those too really are about using this combination of calm abiding and special insight, focusing the mind and then cutting through the, everything that is not really us. They use those to accustom us to our true nature. So deity yoga, for instance, is uh, one of those practices. And in a practice like that, You would imagine that you are a Buddha. You imagine yourself sort of arising out of space in the form of a Buddha. And you ask for the blessings of that Buddha. You become that Buddha. You bless everybody else as that Buddha. And then you dissolve back into space. Not an empty space, but like a luminous space. So that's one way of using the imagination to help get in touch with something that's more real about ourselves than our ordinary perception of ourselves. That's kind of more advanced. I'm not really going to talk about it on the podcast very much, but if you are practicing those kinds of things, you should just know that you're kind of practicing something that will be helpful during the death and rebirth process. And honestly, some version of that can be helpful during the transition process too, when it feels like you're losing some aspect of your ordinary identity, it's super helpful to be able to just get in touch with something that's more real, that's more lasting, that doesn't rely on our current set of circumstances to give our lives meaning. There are other forms of practices that people will do in different Tibetan traditions that are specifically geared toward the death and rebirth process, but honestly, all of it comes back to calm abiding and special insight. It comes back to resting the mind ultimately in its own nature rather than having the mind just go out and be looking for shiny objects all the time. It allows us to rest in who we are. And that's helpful. I keep saying this, but it's helpful in the death and rebirth process. And it's also obviously helpful 
in this lifetime. You can test the efficacy of these practices for you. Do they work? Do they bring you benefit or not in this lifetime? Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of theories about what happens after we die, but we don't really know. But I've found so much benefit from reflecting on these teachings on death and rebirth, these teachings on impermanence, that I feel my life is really enriched by them. So that's why I want to offer them to you as well. There's one final point that I want to make about the bardo of this life in a traditional context, which is that sometimes I have the sense, and I haven't exactly had this conversation with anyone, but I've had it in like maybe other non-Tibetan terms. I have this sense that sometimes people are like, well, why do I need to practice? Like, you know, when I die, everything's just going to be like clear. I'm going to, I'm not sure what the expectation is, but like, boom, everything's going to happen for somebody then. And I don't know, maybe that will happen for them. Maybe it happens to everybody. Maybe I'm wasting my time like doing all these practices and stuff. But the reason that's given in the traditional teachings to really try and use this lifetime as well as we can, to like use it for something meaningful, use it to investigate the nature of ourselves and the nature of reality and like all that cool stuff, is that Once we die, like as we're going through the process of death and we leave behind our body, our mind has no physical basis to ground it. So like right now we have a brain and that brain, you could say it kind of like slows the mind down or like grounds it. It gives it a, a like a center of gravity, you might say. So when my mind wanders off, I can bring my attention back to my breath, for instance. If you don't have a body, you also don't have a breath. And the teachings say that after we are no longer in a body, our mind just goes everywhere. So if you can imagine having ADD and like the world is full of squirrels that you can chase, mentally speaking, can you imagine trying to do practice then? Like, let alone try to recognize your true nature if you're just pulled every which way, you're distracted. Also, if you're not familiar with your true nature, if you've never reflected on like, well, who am I if I'm not just my name? Who am I if I'm not just my social security number, my driver's license number, whatever it is, then this time of the death process can be really disorienting, can really freak people out. And it's not the time to start your practice. It's the time to recognize what you've always been practicing toward, which is your true nature, and have the opportunity to rest in that. If those are teachings from the Tibetan tradition about the bardo of this life, how do they relate to going through transitions? Well, first of all, this is actually why I wanted to talk about this bardo last instead of first, because I think a lot of people who have never been through a big transition or who don't recognize the power of a transition to really shake your world and reform it are not interested in these teachings. So (laughs) I feel like for most of us, we go through a big process of transition, then we come out the other side and we kind of ask like, well, what just happened? And it's at that point that we're trying to make meaning of it and trying to, in some cases, maybe even incorporate the meaning that we found in that transitional space into the rest of our lives going forward. So I want to talk about the bardo of this life in that context. Who are we after we've gone through this big transition and we've found a new sense of identity? And how can we not lose what we gained in terms of knowledge and wisdom about ourselves during that transitional state? So the first thing I want to say about this is that a lot of my own sense of of how to take the benefit of a transitional state forward with us into life actually comes from my own experience with my mom when she was diagnosed with terminal cancer and then she ended up passing away from that. And I found, you know, I was... 27, I want to say, when she was diagnosed, and then 30 when she passed away. And I had been practicing Buddhism for about seven years when she was diagnosed. So I had a pretty stable practice. It was daily, and I had been practicing daily for a long time at that point. But I have to say, there was something in my approach to the Dharma that was it was almost like a hobby, you know, it was like something I did every day because I did it every day. Uh, And It wasn't until 
I went through those three years of increasingly hellish experiences with her as she navigated the world of cancer and healthcare and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm kind of laughing, but it was horrible. <laughs> so it was during that time when, like, the real truth about the world was hitting me for the first time. It was my first, like, really significant um, time to have my world upended by something. You know, to just contemplate, I was really close with my mom's, so to even contemplate like a world without her, it just, it didn't make sense. My brain could not compute it. And it was super scary. And if you've ever, you know, experienced like someone going through really serious intensive cancer treatment with surgeries and chemo and all that stuff, it's pretty traumatic. So it was during that process that I started relating to my daily practice differently. You know, these teachings on <laughs> impermanence and death, I was like, Oh, oh, this is what Buddha was talking about. <laughs> it's it's super easy to meditate on this stuff when it's not like real for you in your life. It's hard to feel the impact of it. But then for me, I found that having spent those years, at least doing the practices without maybe fully realizing they were talking about a real thing, they really laid a groundwork, a foundation for me to be able to have resources to draw on when I really needed them. So I think if I had gotten into this whole hellish bardo state of my mom's illness and her death, and I didn't have those resources, there is no way I would have started practicing then. Maybe someone else in a different circumstance would, or someone else even in that circumstance would have. But when you're in an in intensely painful situation, it's kind of too late. Um, and the other thing is, you know, going through that process, I realized how much I valued my Dharma practice. I realized how much I loved my mom when there was the possibility of losing her. And I got really clear on a lot of other stuff that I had been doing too, you know, what mattered to me and what didn't. And at the end of the day, it was all about love. It was about relationships. And the other things, I just couldn't be bothered with them. And after these massive transitions in my life were over, so my mom passed away in March of 2007. And then in August of 2007, I started grad school in Houston. So I moved and I completely changed my life. I went from like being a professional person to being a grad student and being broke all the time. There was huge changes. But what I found is, it reoriented me in a way that has changed the tra trajectory of my life. It got me interested in all this death and rebirth stuff. And it kind of provided like a crucible for me to tell what's important and what's not. Is this a matter of life and death? Is this something that I'm going to reflect back on on my deathbed and be glad that I did it? Is it worth it to spend time, you know, working when I could be connecting to people. That one I'm still working on. I have a really hard time with that. Uh, unplugging from work. But I'm working on it. So I feel like I came out of that transitional time with, I don't want to say blessings exactly. Because it, it almost feels like it minimizes like the suffering that everyone went through in my family during that time. But there was a tremendous amount that I learned and that I gained during that process and to be able to bring it out the other side and not to forget about it, to to reflect on it from time to time has been really enriching to my life. And I think if I had been eager to just move on to the next chapter, not think about what had just happened, I mean, it's totally understandable, but I definitely wouldn't be living the life that I am now. And I think my life is much richer for having gone through that experience and consciously tried to integrate some of what I learned into who I am now. So I say all that to say it's helpful to practice before you hit a big transition, to have some deep spiritual roots in something. It really supports you and holds you up during that transitional state. And then after the transition, in my case anyway, I found that it had profoundly affected the way I saw myself and the way I saw my world and what I was interested in doing and spending my time on going forward. And in that sense, it really helped to clarify what I value, what has meaning in my life. And I suspect that that's probably true for a lot of people, that if we are able to reflect 
on where we've been, not just try and move on immediately, understand it really as a change in identity rather than just a change in circumstances, that there's a great treasure that we can keep and carry forward with us, moving on from the transition and maybe for the rest of our lives. If you're familiar with the idea of the hero's journey, which Joseph Campbell wrote about in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and there's a lot of other work and writing on it. But if you're familiar with that idea, the idea is, it, it, basically, I see it as a way of talking about transition. So the hero leaves their society, uh, if you think of it in terms of like the trajectory of the original Star Wars movies, like Luke Skywalker leaves Tatooine, his little desert planet. And then the hero goes to a magical place. So he journeys around with uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, learns about the Force, et cetera, et cetera, and is transformed, really, by his time in that magical place. I am saying his. That's kind of sexist of me. His, hers, their time in that magical place. They're transformed, and then they return to their society. And what can happen is a couple of things when they come back. Often, they're returning from this other reality with something that they've found there that's very valuable and precious, but as soon as they bring it back to their society, it falls apart, it decays, it becomes not what it was. And I think that often happens as people go through a transition and just want to move on as quick, as quickly as possible. But by thinking of the time after the transition as a time to integrate what we've just learned about ourselves, what we just learned about the world. Like, holy cow, death is real. It's going to happen to us. If we can take that going forward, then when we come out from that magical realm that we've been in on our own personal hero's journey, maybe we can actually keep that treasure. There is a version of the hero's journey in which that treasure that the hero brings back rejuvenates their society. It doesn't crumble as soon as they sort of bring it back into ordinary reality. Okay, to wrap this up, the main points of this episode, the main points of the teachings on the bardo of this life, and I think the main takeaway for uh, who we are both before and after we've gone through a massive transition. The first one is preparing to die or preparing to go through a transition or hanging on to what you've learned during a transition. You're not just preparing to die or preparing for your next transition. You're preparing to live. The way you live is the way you die. And you can see how you're living based on how your mind is, how your spirit is, how you feel in your body, how you feel in the world. And that's really what contemplative practice is designed to address, is helping us recognize our true nature and live into it. Which leads me to the second point, which is that the more we can recognize our true nature and live into it, the better our life is here and now. So I guess the theme is... <laughs> It's all connected. Life, death, rebirth. It's kind of all happening all the time, honestly. And I hope that through this podcast and other resources and wonderful books like Mind Beyond Death, Dzogchen Panlam Prampache, totally recommend it, that you're able to bring some of these resources in and really transform your life, the way you live and the way you die. Thanks for coming along for today's exploration of the process of letting grow. If you found this episode helpful, please share it. And subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts so you're always in the loop. For links to more content related to today's episode, please see the show notes. See you again next week.